Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, that is a wrap on the story of Oscar Wilde. Although it's set in the 1890s, there's clearly, and maybe quite depressingly, a lot of parallels with the world today. Yes, the scapegoating and fear-mongering over certain groups, a sense of moral panic, the constant threat of public opinion. It just makes you realise how perilous it must have felt to be gay in Victorian England. Yes, and also the dawn of trial by media... Oscars was one of the first that we could see that kind of tabloidy sensationalism coming to the fore, stoking the flames of paranoia and fear. It doesn't actually feel very far from the world now, does it? No, and it's interesting drawing the comparisons in terms of our modern media landscape and seeing the scandal sheets and pamphlets of that time really is the heritage of our tabloid culture today. There's a direct lineage between the sorts of publications that we're talking about Oscar Wilde and the way that we cover celebrities these days. And it just shows that the one consistent thing is our country's appetite for gossip and scandal, talking about people and really enjoying other people's falls from grace. The gossip pamphlet was the sidebar of shame of the day. Uh, As Oscar said, there is only one thing in life worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. And there really is no one better in the world to talk about the legend and mythology of Oscar Wilde than our guest today. Merlin Holland is a British biographer and editor, as well as the only grandchild of Oscar Wilde. He spent over 30 years researching his grandfather's life and works, and he joins us next. I Love My Kid, But is a new comedy parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Each week, the host will share a parenting story that'll have you laughing and thinking, yes, I have absolutely been there. Listen to I Love My Kid, But on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. In the early 1880s, fame eluded Oscar Wilde as he struggled to find a place for his vision of the world. How important do you think that fame was to him as a motivator? Well, it's a very interesting question because on one hand, he says somewhere that the more one talks about the artist, the less of value his art really is. So when you think how much he made himself talked about it was important to him. I mean, he, one says that he is the first of the famous people. I think it meant a great deal to him, but at the same time, he was very ambivalent about it. His big breakout moment is the picture of Dorian Gray. Why do you think it shocks people so much? Well, it's interesting because in 1887 to 89, he was the editor of a woman's magazine. He was reviewing books for the Pall Mall Gazette, for example, one of the big newspapers of the time. So he was in danger. He was teetering dangerously on the edge of respectability. And that's not what he wanted. And he writes an essay called The Decay of Lying, which was a plea for more imagination in literature. He wanted the British to get away from the the boring three-volume novel. It's what Lady Bracknell refers to as a three-volume novel of more than tedious sentimentality. I mean, the realism in an English novel at the time, romantic though it might have been, was something he wanted people to get away from. And that became a sort of manifesto. And a couple of years later, he writes the picture of Dorian Gray, for an American magazine. And originally, he offered one of his fairy stories, The Fisherman and His Soul, similarities there, the the man who sells his soul for supernatural powers. And that was turned down. And then he produced Dorian Gray in a matter of four or five months. And the storm of protest 
when it came out was absolutely extraordinary. He was attacked on all sides and largely because of the homosexual overtones. There's a point in which, in the story, the painter, Basil Hallwood, confesses his love for Dorian. And I adored you madly, passionately, absurdly. I've never really loved a woman. I've never had the time. And this was considered absolutely beyond the pale. And incidentally, it was omitted from the book version which came out the following year. It's a very un thing to do, to listen to critics and think, uh-oh, I think I may have overstepped the mark there, but he did. But he was attacked by the newspapers and memorably replied to one of them, good people exasperate one's reason, bad people stir one's imagination. And that, that from that moment onwards, that became a sort of his guiding light in life in a way. I feel like at every point in the story, we've come back to this idea that London society couldn't decide if they found him fascinating or horrifying. That feels like the kind of overarching theme of all of his interactions. That's absolutely right, yes. And I think the moment they were, they felt pretty uncomfortable with the picture of Dorian Gray. They felt fairly uncomfortable, I think, with his openly flaunting young Alfred Douglas um, if you were homosexual in those days, and there were a fair number of homosexuals in London who led a very discreet life, you didn't parade yourself around with your lover. I think the moment that he overstepped the mark, he became, I think, a scapegoat. And it was also a marvellous opportunity to put away this man who had imported, in a sense, uh, what one of the newspapers talked about, the literature of the French decadence. But to be able to put him in prison, not just for his homosexual behaviour, but also for this decadent literature, as it was seen, was a perfect opportunity. Do you think he courted the outrage and disapproval? I think he did. There's a point in the long letter which he writes from prison. It's a sort of confessional, but in the form of a letter to young Alfred Douglas. And he says at one point, people thought it dreadful of me to have entertained the evil things of life. They were gilded snakes to me. Their poison was part of their perfection. It was like feasting with panthers. The danger was half the excitement. And that again sums up, I think, he obviously in prison writing this, he regrets what he has done. But I think that at a point, it was this danger, he courted danger. And I think it became almost a way of life in itself. It was almost his way of feeling relevant. Yes, exactly. Yes. Although, of course, by the time he reacts to the Marquis of Queensbury's visiting card on which he's written to Oscar Wilde posing as somdomite, misspelled in his fury, uh, he feels, I think, with two plays running concurrently in the West End of London, bringing in the equivalent of about £100 each a week. I mean, if you work that up in today's money, it's somewhere between fifteen and £20,000. He felt that he was almost untouchable. The law couldn't touch him. And I think this happens today, you know, the the person who sues the newspaper feeling that because they are a public personality, because the public loves them, because the jury will be composed of people who've seen their plays or their appearances on television or whatever it is, they're going to get away with it. But they don't. It's that terribly dangerous cocktail of arrogance and the feeling that you are going to win against what you regard as um, calumny on the part of somebody who is your inferior. A recurring trope in this show is the partners of the people who are at the centre of these scandals. Of course, the person to be impacted perhaps most by Oscar's controversies and notoriety was his wife, your grandmother, Constance. What impact do you see it as having had on her? Well, I think she was aware of something being not right in their marriage. Not terribly early on. I mean, there's a point in 1892 
when Oscar and Constance go up and spend a month or so in Norfolk and young Alfred Douglas appears and Constance then takes her two children, my father and my uncle, off to Devon to a friend of hers there and Oscar and Bosie Douglas remain in Norfolk and Bosie falls ill and Oscar writes to Constance and Constance says, would you like me to come and help look after him? I mean, that's not the attitude of a woman who suspects her husband of having a homosexual affair with a man who's fallen ill. And you don't suppose that was her trying to call his bluff? I don't think so. I don't. I mean, in those days, don't forget, men would go out on their own in the evenings and the wives would stay at home. Putting it into context, his behaviour wasn't entirely unusual. And I think she rather liked the idea that there were these young men around him who were saying how marvellous he was and how marvellous his plays were uh, and his poetry and so on and so on. And it was a sort of reflection on her marriage and her being together with this man who was, yes, a, you know, not very conventional, certainly, but very much the talk of London. I think she quite enjoyed that. How did you view Oscar and Constance's relationship? How would you have categorised it? I think the relationship between Oscar and Constance is something which is frequently much misunderstood. While he's in prison and she comes from Italy, where she is living in exile, to tell him about the death of his mother, there's no other person who the family reckoned could have done it. But Constance was prepared to do that for this husband of hers. And when Oscar comes out of prison, he is a convict, he's a homosexual, and he's a bankrupt. And any one of those in Victorian times would put you beyond the pale. Constance would like to have got back together with him. They, I don't think a, a relationship would have lasted. Oscar was, you know, confirmedly homosexual by that stage. But that wouldn't have stopped him getting back and seeing his wife and seeing his children. But her friends were dead against it because how would you accept back into society a woman together with her convict, homosexual, bankrupt husband? It would have been extremely difficult. So the best thing to do was to keep them apart. And that's exactly what happened after prison. She was all for going up to northern France where he settled down for a bit after coming out of prison. And it's a terribly sad thing. It's the minor tragedy which follows on to the major tragedy, which is that he could have seen his children and he could have seen his wife. But he was deeply fond of her. He loved her, after all. I mean, you don't have two children with her. You could have had one, even if, you know, it was what I believe is called a lavender marriage. Um, but I think there was a great deal of love on both sides and I think it was destroyed both by, obviously, by the trials but also by the environment in which they both lived and the people who were trying to keep them apart. To give you some idea of how the relationship between them was in 1891 when he publishes his second volume of fairy stories, A House of Pomegranates, he dedicates the whole book to Constance. And the individual stories are dedicated to posh women of his acquaintance, Princess Alice of Monaco and Lady Mount Temple and so on and so on. But he writes to her with a copy of this book saying, to you, the cathedral is dedicated. The individual side chapels are to other saints. So accept the book as your own and made for you. The candles that burn at the altars are not so bright or beautiful as the great lamp of the shrine, which is of gold and has a wonderful heart of restless flame. And that's how he felt. It's verging on the purple prose, but it's not quite. You feel that in there there's a sincerity of love that he feels for this woman, and that's in 1891. I wonder if you think that his relationship with Bosie was a turning point, because it feels like you might not have described his behaviour as discreet before that, but it then seems to have become reckless. Yes, that's absolutely right. I think going around public places in London with young Alfred Douglas, 
And having Douglas's father say to him, if I catch you together in a public place, I'll horsewhip you, shows exactly how indiscreet Oscar was behaving. What is interesting is that the relationship between Oscar and Douglas is always pointed at as being the reason that Oscar went to prison. And of course, the reason Oscar went to prison is because of his relationships with the young male prostitutes of London. His relationship with Bosey it never became part of the indictment in Oscar's criminal trial. But perhaps his encouragement to pursue legal routes. Yes, that's absolutely right. I think it was an attempt by Alfred Douglas to avenge himself of his father, who he detested. And he was using Oscar as a cat's paw. Oscar says in that long letter from prison, De Profundis, neither you nor your father, multiplied a thousand times over, could have ruined a man like me. I ruined myself. And I think that says it all. It was the collateral damage of his relationship with Bosey Douglas, which brought the libelous card, which brought the libel action, which brought all the revelations, and finally the arrest and the conviction for what was so quaintly called gross indecency. What's your feeling towards Bosey? What's your analysis of him? Uh, I'm afraid I have a rather perverted <laughs> view of Bosey Douglas. When everybody else condemns him, I say, well, you know, my grandfather... He was a bit of a snob. He liked the relationship with the young aristocrat. Bosey Douglas's poetry was extraordinarily good. He was one of the great sonnet writers of the age. So I tend to protect him slightly from the accusations of being a nasty, evil influence on Oscar's life, perhaps wrongly. It's much later after Oscar's death. And then, I'm afraid, he loses all my sympathy. But before, when he is with Oscar, young, beautiful, a poet, an aristocrat. I understand him. Ah, the Bahamas. What if you could hang out with celebrities, live in a penthouse above the crystal clear ocean with all your best friends, and have it be 100% paid for? FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried made that dream a reality, but U.S. prosecutors say he was hiding a dark secret. Barely 30, the young crypto billionaire became a powerful financial figure. But in just one month, his exchange would collapse and SBF would find himself in handcuffs. It's one of the most dramatic falls from grace and represents one of the most spectacular failures of corporate control in American history. Hear exclusive tape of Sam and his former girlfriend and business partner, Caroline Ellison, who later admitted something had gone very wrong inside their operation. From Bloomberg and Wondery comes Spellcaster, a new six-part docuseries about the meteoric rise and fall of FTX and its founder, Sam Bankman-Fried. Follow Spellcaster wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to episodes ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. It's hard to understand why Oscar undertook the initial libel trial when so much was at stake. Do you have a sense of his motivations? Why did he feel compelled to sue Queensbury? I think it was partly because he loved Alfred Douglas. And Alfred Douglas wanted to see his father behind bars. It's a terrible thing for a son to want to see his father behind bars, but... <laughs> The relationship between them had been so violent, in a way, that this was Bosey's reaction to his father's behavior. There is a, a very extraordinary what-if moment in the whole thing. After Oscar receives Queensbury's card, he writes to Robert Ross, his first young male lover, and the one whose judgment he always seems to rely on. And he writes to Robbie and says, can you come tonight? Something terrible has happened. The ivory tower has been assailed by the foul thing. I've asked Bosey to come tomorrow. And on the back of the note, Robbie has written, I arrived at, I can't remember what hour, and Bosey was already there. So Oscar has asked Bosey to come. He's obviously told Bosey what has happened. 
And Bosie thinks, right now, it's the moment I've got to strike now while the iron's hot. And if Robbie had got there before and if Bosie hadn't come until the following day, would Robbie have talked sense into him? Tear the card up. Don't be silly. This is madness. I think he probably would have done. But it's one of those great what-if moments in the whole tragedy. A substantial part of Edward Carson's case was built on using Wilde's work against him in the trials. Why do you think it was so important for Oscar to defend his works in court? Well, I think that's the other side of this strange dual side of Oscar, if you like. He's going to defend his works at all cost. When Edward Carson picks up on the very passage which was in the original magazine version, which was overtly homosexual, and leaves it out of the book. Edward Carson goes back to the magazine version and quotes the magazine version, which wrong-foots Oscar and his counsel. And he then has to defend him. Have you ever adored a young man madly passionate? No, I prefer love. It is a higher emotion. And at that moment, you think he's trying to get the better of a very successful, very sharp advocate. And a bit later, Edward Carson mentions the relationship which Oscar is supposed to have had with a a servant when he'd taken a cottage near Henley. And Edward Carson says, and did you ever kiss him? And Oscar says, oh dear, no, he was far too ugly. I pitied him for it. Whoops. You know, that you can imagine the sort of Pinterian pregnant pause. And Edward Carson says, you what? And it's at that moment, I think, it's just one joke too many. He talks himself into prison. From that moment onwards, you just feel it's all over. Do you think his humour was a defence or was it just that he simply loved to entertain? I'm afraid it was just because he loved to entertain. I mean, he regards the court, he regards the old Bailey as a theatre. He's playing to the gallery, he's playing for laughs. Was that naive, though? It was a terribly naive way to view the whole legal process. Yes, absolutely. But again, you've got to remember he has these two plays running simultaneously in London, The Ideal Husband, The Importance of Being Earnest, making him huge sums of money every week. And he feels that he's above the law. In a way, this was the first celebrity trial of its kind, and with it, a trial by media. What was the role of the press in Oscar's trials? It's an interesting question. I think certainly in the first trial, the libel trial, I don't think the papers had a great influence. There was one thing which happened, which was that during... His first trial, after he'd been arrested, his first trial for homosexual behaviour, for gross indecency, the split of the jury was recorded by a newspaper and was taken up by various provincial newspapers as well. So it was widely reported. Well, now today, if the split of a hung jury had been reported in the press, I think it would have been considered contempt of court and probably a danger for any further trial to take place. But that wasn't the case. So in as far as the press influenced anything, it could possibly be that that report of the split, a majority in favour of conviction, could have influenced the final outcome. Yes, that's possible. You've written about the establishment making a spectacle of Oscar Wilde through the case. Why do you think that was? Well, there was this famous case in 1889, the so-called Cleveland Street scandal, with the Telegraph Boys acting unofficially as a sort of young male brothel, in which all the protagonists seemed to get away scot-free. So public opinion was running pretty high, and I think the government needed to show that they were going to act in a a public case like this. Oscar Wilde has sued the Marquis of Queensbury for libel, He's been arrested because of the evidence which came out in open court. And now we're going to make sure that he gets punished and that will put an end to this disgraceful, disgusting vice once and for all. And, of course, what they did is to wheel in one of the top lawmen 
the Attorney General, Sir Frank Lockwood, whose job as a prosecuting attorney was in cases of rape and murder and treason, not for a misdemeanor, as gross indecency was called. Uh, so he was, they were going to make absolutely certain that they got him and that they put him away. And what effect did the trials have on the country as a whole and what were the repercussions for other gay men? There have been modern gay commentators who've said that Oscar Wilde, in doing what he did, put back the gay cause by 30 years, which I suppose, in a way, you can say that he did. Had he not sued the Marquis of Queensbury and had the libel trial not led to his own conviction and to an outpouring of outrage and, in a sense, sort of public gratitude that the authorities had put away this man who was indulging in these filthy practices as they saw it. I mean, for years after his death, his plays were played and his books were read, but about his private life, one kept quiet. And I think that it had quite a substantial effect on gay men's behavior for years afterwards. In the 1950s, John Gielgud, the actor, was prosecuted for cottaging. He was due to unveil the plaque to Oscar Wilde on his house in Tite Street. And he had to write to the organizers and say, in the circumstances, I'm afraid that I think I must withdraw for the sake of everybody. And the organizers then found it extremely difficult. I think they approached about eight or ten different people. E.M. Forster, Laurence Olivier, they all distanced themselves from it. If you'd asked an actor to unveil a plaque to Oscar Wilde on the house in Tite Street, they would have said yes immediately. Um, in those days, even in 1954, I think the echoes of this scandal were still reverberating. There's no, absolutely no doubt about it at all. My father wrote an autobiography, Son of Oscar Wilde, in which the words homosexuality or homosexual simply do not appear. It was about his own life, admittedly, but the, the echoes of this scandal, they've reverberated right up until the end of the last century. No doubt about it at all. To your point about these echoes and reverberations of Oscar's life, can you tell us the story of how you ended up with Holland as your surname? Well, my grandmother, Constance, Oscar's wife, stayed on, believe it or not, until well after the end of his second trial at which he was convicted and sent to prison. I believe she stayed on just in case he got off. The relationship between the two of them was an extraordinary one. Constance was deeply loyal to him. And when Oscar came out of prison, she was all for rushing up from where she was living on the continent under a new name. And the name of Holland was an old family name on her side of the family. But changing the name was something I don't think she really wanted to do, but she had to do it for the sake of her children apart from anything else. Do you ever think about restoring Wild? I thought about it around the year 2000, and I made the mistake of saying to somebody in the press, I suppose this would be the time to do it, perhaps, and perhaps then became maybe, and maybe became Merlin Holland is thinking of, and then when is he going to do it? <laughs> so from then onwards, I thought no. And in a sense, I'm much more my father's son than my grandfather's grandson. He did ask me at the age of 21 because it was something I think he wanted to do. He would like to have taken the name back, did try indeed in sometime around 1910 and found it was not a good idea. But I thought for a moment, and I thought, no, you're my father. I never knew Oscar. I'm proud of his writing and what he did and so on, but... No, I'm, I'm a Holland, I'm your son. And it also means that someone like you has to ask me why, and then I have to explain. And so the whole Victorian hypocritical mentality 
can be aired once again. Let this be the end of it. This is the final word on the matter. <laughs> on on changing the name. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is, yes. I'm it's it's too far away. <laughs> it's a permanent rebuke to Victorian morality. Let's put it like that. I mean you can see the family resemblance. You look oh like Oscar. My Wilde. wife says the older and fatter I get, the more I resemble Oscar, which is not very flattering. <laughs> no, but do you ever wonder do you look at yourself in the mirror sometimes and think, I look like Oscar Wilde or, or do you wonder sometimes, maybe with your own thoughts, actually that's the legacy of Oscar Wilde? No, I never do that. And I think that goes back to childhood when I was told quite firmly, and this was in the 1950s and 60s, I was told quite firmly if anybody says, oh, was Oscar Wilde your grandfather? You just say, yes, he was, and change the subject. I mean, it was that still in the 1960s. It was still in parts of Britain, I think. You know, one read the fairy stories to one's children or went to see the plays, but still you'd, the private life was you know, not a subject really for discussion. And my father lived the whole of his life until 1967 under that law which was passed in 1885 and which condemned his own father. It was repealed partly, not entirely, but partly just three months before my father died. Makes you think... Did you ever speak about that? No. And the reason we never spoke about it, I think, is because I was born 45 years after Oscar died. My mother was born 10 years after he died. We had no common memories. We couldn't say, do you remember when Grandfather did this or that or the other? And so he was part of the wallpaper. He was there. All we would have done was to discuss the latest play or the latest biography, although the, in the 1950s there weren't that many biographies written about Oscar. It, it came later after the publication of his letters in 1962, and that showed a very different man. He wasn't just the sort of two-dimensional funny man struggling to get out of the second division of literature. He was a, a scholar, apart from anything else, at Oxford. And I think that after that, it was after the publication of those letters when we saw a very human side to Oscar Wilde that the modern interest in him started to, to grow. It must be so confusing for you at times, or, or conflicting, because on the one hand, you're your own man, but on the other hand, you're writing books about your famous grandfather. Does that legacy ever feel like a burden? Yes. <laughs> In what way? <laughs> well, it's the burden of expectation. It's the, you know, the monkey in the cage, throw him a handful of peanuts, see what he does. Is he as funny as his grandfather? No. Does he write as well as no? It's, it's this burden of, of having something which people perhaps expect of you. It was expected of me at one stage because there were one or two small things like the correspondence, which was still in copyright. Um, and I felt that I should just take it over, but realise that all the academics who were writing about Oscar, biographers writing about it, they knew far more about him than I did. And so it became a sort of point of honour to try and uh, understand him and his work and his life in a great deal more depth. And once you get sucked into Oscar Wilde's studies, it's pretty difficult to get out. Not that I object to it, but I think it's, it becomes so fascinating in the end all the myth-making, the exaggerations, the lies even, which are told. Uh, he said at one point, one should never destroy the myths around a man. They tell us more about his real character than the truth itself. And I think there's an element of truth in that. But when, when you're exaggerating to put more bums on cinema seats or sell more books or whatever it is, I think there are limits. And, you know, once in a while one has to tap on the table and say, enough is enough. Reading his works now, you're struck by the prescience of his outlook. What do you think Oscar would have made of the world today? Can I turn that question round? Yep. What would the modern world made of Oscar? <laughs> and I think the answer is probably not a lot. I think he would pass almost unnoticed because he... In the 1890s, he has cultivated himself as an individual in an age of conformity. So today, when everybody is desperately trying to be an individual, Oscar Wilde as an individual, I'm not saying he'd pass unnoticed, certainly, 
but he wouldn't be a talk show host. He'd be a talk show guest. <laughs> Uh, what would they have made of him? What do they make of him, I think, is also a relevant question, and that is that he's always represented to me four quite important things. Revolt, individuality, integrity, and sensuality. Revolt against the norms of his age, individuality in an age of conformity, integrity in standing up for what he believed in at more or less whatever cost, and the preaching of sensuality, being in touch with your senses, being in touch with your feminine side. And when you think about these four things, revolt, individuality, integrity, and sensuality, what person today, young person today of 18 to 25, doesn't say to themselves, yes, those are the qualities which I would like to aspire to. And I think that's probably, in part, why his popularity endures well into the 21st century. It's the young who are going to keep him alive. Well, you've certainly drawn us in, Merlin. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. No, it's a great pleasure. I think I should leave you with one little thing, which is a quotation out of one of his plays. I adore gossip. History is merely gossip. But scandal is gossip made tedious by morality. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it couldn't be more pertinent. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to Merlin for joining us on the show. You can buy Merlin's book, Conversations with Oscar Wilde, at all good bookshops and probably some of the bad ones too. Uh, Matt, it is your turn to scandalise the nation next week. What have we got in store? Well, I'm going to tell you the story of the relationships and rivalries within the biggest rock and roll band of the swinging 60s. It's a story with tragedy, excitement, glamour and even a few conspiracy theories and it's all centred around the band's troubled, enigmatic founder, Brian Jones. Can't wait, see you next week. This is the fourth and final episode in our series, Oscar Wilde. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read The Secret Life of Oscar Wilde by Neil McKenna. Oscar Wilde by Richard Elman, Bosie by Douglas Murray, and To the End of the World, Travels with Oscar Wilde by Rupert Everett. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondery. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com survey.